talking about innovation in the future of single family rental ownership. We're going to talk about AI. We're going to talk about technology that we have right now and things that we may have in the future. And to do that, I've got some great guests with me. I'm going to be your host for this one. So you've been hearing from me a lot over the past half hour, but in this, I'm going to try and shut up and let these guys talk as much as possible. I'm going to go around the room and let them introduce themselves. We're going to start with Michael Lee, since he's a coworker. He's the vice president of product here at Poplar Homes. Michael, if you'd introduce yourself, that would be great. Yeah, again, uh, this, my, my name is Michael Lee. I'm the VP of product, as Justin said here. I, I came uh, onto Poplar via, via an acquisition. I used to own a, 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 a property management company myself here. We had about 600 doors here. Previously to that, I was in the high-tech field for about, what, 15 years here. I worked for various uh, companies such as Dell, group on and into it here. So it's great to be back in the tech role here, Justin. Great to have you. We're going to stay in first name alphabetical, and I'm going to introduce Nate and let him describe where he's at. He is the host of the Prop Tech podcast. So he's been talking tech with all these people for years now. So he's very steeped in this stuff. Nate, you want to give us a little bit about your background? Yeah, yeah. So thank you, uh, as you mentioned, host of the TechNext podcast, uh, where I interview founders, investors, and leaders in real estate tech to find the ways they're transforming the way we buy, sell, and invest in real estate. Just published episode 175 this morning. So I've been doing that for just a few years, talking to a few people, understanding the, the latest tech and trends in the, the real estate world. I come from the real estate industry in multiple capacities, literally building homes, having sold homes, and investing in properties, residential, short-term rental, and uh, storage properties as an investor. Uh, in the last six years, I've exclusively focused on the marketing side and distribution of prop tech tools and services. I uh, was at uh, Avail, a platform for mom pop landlords, and, and helped lead us to acquisition. And most recently was at the insure tech startup, Obi, uh, helping build out and create the marketing team and program that is currently in place. Thank you. I'm I'm thrilled to have you on. We've talked a couple of times and every time I find out more that I didn't know about everything. And last alphabetically, but certainly not least, Tim Rose, who is with Planomatic and a specific sub of that called uh, Plano Labs, correct? Yes. Yes. So uh, well, first of all, Nate, congrats on 175. That's incredible. Um, uh, yeah. So I, uh, I'm in charge of the Plano Labs team at Planomatic. So we're focused on product and innovation. Um, I personally come from a consulting background and then I've been at Planomatic now for 10 years and half of that time was on the retail side. Um, and then the other half uh, more recently has been on um, the rental housing industry and specifically single family rental. Um, and at Planomatic, we are the nation's largest provider of marketing services for the SFR industry. Um, so we focus on professional photography, 3D tours, floor plans, a lot of this has become even more important over the last couple of years uh, with the COVID pandemic, virtual touring, things like that. Um, and so we just, we try to do it high quality at warp speed, um, get down to the basics. And kind of my perspective here with the kind of product innovation side, this is our lead in Justin. Um, <laughs> we're trying to figure out, you know, what else can we do capturing more data on site? So talking to a lot of our clients about, okay, we're taking photos, but what else can we tell you about the property? Uh, because without that, you can't really make a tool, make any AI tool work. And so we're um, trying to kind of provide that baseline to some of our more innovative clients right now. Okay. So with that, I'm going to dive right into a product I saw for the first time last week. It's not retail yet, and it doesn't even work great. It's just, they're testing it and trying to figure out how to use it, but it's taking a video walkthrough of a home and turning it into a video three or not a video. It's, it's a 3d tour. It's, it's like nerfs or nerms or refs have you seen that yet it's super crazy because it's generating 3d information off of a video walkthrough yes yeah the i don't i can't talk about the acronym that you're that you're getting to specifically <laughs> but i know that the kind of the technology to create a 3d tour experience is only getting better and better and you know a lot of it is catered towards diy self-service types um, and so I always look at those from, okay, what is like the enterprise version of that look like? What are the actual, like, we still have to get to Zillow and we still have to get to all the different ILS platforms and it still has to be visible to a consumer. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't look at not to look at things from like a cynical lens, but you know, that's where my brain goes right away. Right. Where I'm like, okay, it'd be great to map out a 3d tour, 
but then how does that translate to marketing a property? Right. Um, so we're, we're constantly now, you know, I have a pretty long list of really cool 3D tour technologies and then it's a matter of go to market as well. So this is something that we saw Zillow had their own 3D tour for a while. And I know that while you guys were producing your own, you couldn't get them to Zillow for a while. And I think it's only been two or three years that you could fully load them up. How did that process yep. work? Like, how do you institutionalize that and then get it to Zillow and apartments and rentals? And Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of the, and our clients of course help vocalize and, and chip away at this, right? Cause they're saying we're paying you this money to list our properties and, Let's just get with the times here. Cause yeah, Zillow on their platform, they it well they used to only accept their own 3D tour technology and then they expanded that to maybe two or maybe three. But now that list is 20, right? And I I think more and more these technologies will become more agnostic. There are still some holdouts um on the ILS platform side. But again, I, I think that just comes with time, right? Where there's so many different versions of the technology that I think more softwares need to become more agnostic to say, it doesn't matter where this 3D tour came from, we understand it and we can just play it on the platform because they're all competing for clicks and views and, and all that, right? To make their platform, yeah. uh, you know, more valuable. So so they're, they're in a battle for rich media as well. I think Zillow understood that pretty quick, especially kind of coming out of 2020, 2021. That's when we saw the shift of eh, actually just bring all the 3D tours over here. Uh, the more, the merrier. And I think more platforms will do that. Yeah. So with that same topic, let's, uh, Nate or Michael, do you guys have any input on that process of getting something that is technically feasible to a mass market adoption? Like, cause this is going to happen now with chat GPT and AI and all those things. We're seeing that trying to happen. I mean, from a marketing side of things, I, I think about this a lot and I, I kind of put it into two buckets. When you're thinking about distribution, you have demand generation and demand capture. I look to the auto industry as the greatest example of uh, understanding the difference between the two and how they navigate this. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of the automobile, uh, you know, windshield wipers were not popular when they were first added, you were lazy because you couldn't pull a string to clear the water off your windshield, right? We say to roll the window up. Someone had to tell you you needed a switch to press versus a crank, right? The fact that we have backup cameras on a car, like how bad of a driver are you that you can't parallel without a camera? But all these features added to a car today see commonplace. At some right. point, someone had to generate demand for that as a tool, and to create some sort of like interest in that. You aren't going to the car lot because you wanted a car with a backup camera. You need a new car. But once you discovered that feature and you experienced it, now suddenly, hey, well, no, that's my criteria. I want that. And what was previously a, a premium feature, and there's like, a, I think Ford, one of their car commercials was awesome because they, they showed someone like literally struggling to switch lanes and they needed a sensor to tell them that there's a car in the blind spot. Features like this will become table stakes. At some point, it's expensive to be the front runner and to be first in the market to do this. So that's a bit of a challenge. That's in the demand generation side. Anytime though, you're the, you're the company, you're the startup, you're the tech that is having to generate the demand. You've got to find where existing demand is first and capture. From there, it's it's a it's an iterative process in how you want to generate demand. Of course, you can go the blitz scaling route where if you've got venture. Uh, capital and you've got extremely deep pockets and you want to burn cash until everyone finally hears of your name, you can try that route. Um, I do think that PropTech has a little bit of a, uh, a troubled past with attempts to blitz scale uh, and not really achieving the results that they wanted to, even though they got their brand recognition. So I, I think any, anytime you're uh, trying to get something new into the consumer's hands, you got to start where there's existing demand and then build and iterate on that until that technology becomes table stakes. And I'll quote from, you know, this is, this is not a direct quote, but like Pat Kinsell of Proof, formerly known as Notarize. Uh, I've heard him talk about this for some time. Uh, you know, they're a digital notary service and how do they how do they make the progress they're making? And sometimes it's just, you have to wait it out. The tech is there. You have the idea of growing like a tech company, but you've just got to wait it out until the pieces come into place. Real estate's one of those industries. There's going to be some yeah. wait for demand to catch up. Yeah. I, 
I can tell you have a podcast. You speak very well. And you're very aware of this stuff. It's great. Thanks, Nate. Um, pivoting on that from the demand generation and capture side to the actual implementation side, Michael, what's your experience been of trying to roll out any of these new cool things? Yeah, I mean, from what the we, application side, real estate is really based on on, on the one where and I always use the word trust, right? Uh, and so, uh, without this trust and without the relationship here, it tech seems to. I come from a world where. You know, like I said, I used to work at Intuit, we used, used to work at Groupon here where we just roll it out and people adopt it fairly quickly here. But in the real estate industry, it's 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 really built based off of human relationships first and then building up on trust, right? You're dealing with assets that basically are are probably the, well, they are, they are the most expensive or high value assets here. So uh, developing that trust, it, it's a long game basically and then once you develop the trust it, it, you, the, the, the adoption of the technology happens a lot quicker but but yeah it, it, it's without that trust uh that 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 adoption uh happens at a much lower pace than what I'm personally used to that makes sense yeah I I think that the brand and the trust go hand in hand the brand has to build and represent that trust when you see it on the label you have to see Pepsi and trust it'll taste like Pepsi see Coke and know it'll taste like Coke Famously, Coke, when they did new Coke, they broke that trust for a while. Um, mm. Unity recently had that problem. So in the new technologies that are out there, specifically all of the different AI stuff from the image generators to the stuff that can pull out information from a static image, and then chat GPT, which is generating uh, text and dialogue, but looks to be even more expansive next. How do those play into the real estate space? And Nate, I'd kind of like to hear your thoughts first. I mean, I think the obvious applications here is automating some processes and communications that I think to many people, that's the obvious, right? If ChatGTP can write an email for you and you can set that up today. Uh, any company, a mom pop to some degree can actually be leveraging AI with a simple Zapier integration, you know, I, and I test this out to kind of prove it out for myself. I had uh, a form on my website powered by Airtable embed. And then it sends a zap with those fields and then to a prompt to chat GPT, which then wrote an email and it was sent from my Gmail, just confirming to the person who submitted the form into Airtable. Was that overly complicated? Totally. But it just demonstrated how relatively accessible uh, some of the obvious applications here is for some of your communications. I like, um, you know, there, there's, there's a, an app called Libby. Uh, this was released by Spencer Roscoff. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of it just kind of, I think it was a few months ago. And the idea is that it's a pretty quick and simple, easy to set up chat bot. Uh, and I think about this from a real estate perspective. Um, you know, you can give it some basic, so you can train your little chat bot with some basic answers and information. And then in a conversational way, it's able to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, anytime someone's shopping for a new unit, whether they're renting or buying, time to response is really important. And so if you're yeah. able to have some sort of, you know, real-time response uh, to be able to give the information, yes, this unit's available. This is the application fee. This is what we'll ask for up front. This is how this works. Anyone could set that up. It's embeddable in your website. It can be as a, an additional link that you put into a confirmation email. Um, there's, there's many different ways of using it. So I think those are some of the immediate and instant obvious uh, use cases. Um, you know, and of course, like, and I, I'll, 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 I want to stop. I want to stop soon here. But the last one is, uh, I think there's been a lot of talk around AI and its application of tenant screening, uh, and determining who really is a, a better tenant or who poses less risk. There's estimates. Uh, I think I don't want to say Rent Manager put one out. It was like 400 million annually that property managers uh, could be losing uh, due to. Uh, poorly written risk with the wrong tenants, something along mm -hmm. those lines. Um, and, you know, I think there's some complications to that. I'm sure we're going to get into that a little later on. But again, I think that's another obvious use of, okay, with this credit score and this, this uh, you know, to residency history, which one's really likely to be a better tenant versus the other. Um, I think that those are some of the, the, the clear cut cases and already, you know, being put into practice today. Yeah, Tim, do you want to follow up on that? Because I'm curious as to how this this rolls into your space. Of course. Yeah, it, it's funny because thinking through some of what I wanted to say, I wrote down automation, 
and it's screening. So yeah, John. Um, so yeah, I mean, the the other angle of it that I think a lot about, just like how is it not just our world, right, but but the world of just the housing industry is um, the data, right? And I, I don't know if there's like a 2010 term they talk about big data. That was like the big. I worked at IBM at the time, and I always talked about big data. Um, but again, in order for like AI to be effective, you need the data and you kind of need to understand like, where is this coming from? So yeah, when it comes to screening applicants, you're going to know so much more, not just about the applicant, but also about the other applicants that have become proof points of these were good payers. These are great residents. You know, this one is kind of comparable to that one. Of course, on the acquisition side, you have so much more information now or access to more information. I mean, that's the power of AI, right? Not just having a few, you know, data fields that you can filter by, it can know so much at once. Um, and you can kind of pick its brain on what has been the trend in this market, what, how have other properties performed um, and that kind of thing. So I, I just, I think it's, you know, kind of translating to our world. I, this is what I alluded to at the beginning. Um, PMs have to be very intentional about data of the property itself and not just kind of like descriptor fields. I mean, it, you know, there's data sets out there that obviously give you zip code, school zone, square footage of the home, things like that. But it's not going to tell you if it has a hardwood floor or a carpet or if it, what appliances are inside of the home and what possible, you know, OPEX or CAPEX um, you're going to incur. And so that's, that's what we are working on as a company. But I think we have to think, okay, in order to get the power of AI, you have to have the data behind it. Um, and you know, they, for us, a gap currently is what's inside of the house. Hmm. So that big data model that you're thinking about is instead of just the title data that you can get from data tree or first American, which is just the basic stuff, right. Or even the stuff that's coming out of the MLS with the, the parameters of every room and even the carpet. But then if you're talking the way I think you are, you're going, what if we get in all of the appliance numbers and when the roof was last replaced and when the pool went in and when the the doors and windows were put in. So then all of a sudden you have all this stuff that you can ask it and go out of my portfolio, which property is most likely to need a new refrigerator first? Like that kind of direction. Yeah. Hmm. That's right. That's and, and I, because I think that that helps the PM a lot with their conversations with their clients. Right. Cause it's not just, I'm not just asking for a new fridge. Like here's, here's the trend or here's the risk factor. And here, you know, based on um, all the data uh, that we have that we put together. So I, and yeah, yeah, we need it. Right. And and obviously it has obvious implications for the resident where, you know, we're maybe staying ahead of this a little bit more uh, to make a, a more efficient, you know, repair replace decision, maybe just replace it at the turn because, you know, it's uh, it's on its last legs, that kind of thing. Yeah. Michael, where do you see us implementing these things? AI, chat GPT, yeah. large language models. Yeah, I'd like to kind of add what Tim just stated here. I mean, that's that's really the last mile actually getting in the house, right? A lot of realtors and uh, and property man, when we do comp analysis, the, the 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 question is, well, I don't really trust this data unless you actually visit the property, right? And so so to Tim's point, you know, you're leveraging AI to actually maybe we you know could visualize and see there's actually hardwood floors. Uh, what have you, right? Is it updated uh, kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. That really isn't, that sort of data isn't, that's not necessarily inputted directly, but in the comp analysis, but it certainly factors into it. So so using that, I call it what Amazon always refers to the last mile, right? The last bit of it here. That's the missing piece of the puzzle. If we solve that, I think we could solve a lot of these uh, comp analysis process. But but yeah, to, to everyone's point here, you know, AI certainly could uh, definitely, definitely, uh, could help of all industries. I think property real estate is one of the uh, benefactors here. Um, everyone's we, we just one thing I also notice about automation and AI, especially for the booking. Um, it helps you. You know, this is uh, Justin. We talked about writing this marketing descriptors using ChatGPT to leverage that. So that saves a lot of time here. Uh, but getting back to the self showing and booking here, you know, I heard um, was some stats that uh, Zillow said only. Only five percent of of people who are prospects who 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 do showings or schedule showings actually apply, and that's due to the delays and and what have you. In the old traditional model, if you could imagine it, a yeah. a, a prospect would call in, 
uh, you know, ask them basic questions. Does this property take pets? Does it have you know, how many, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and it takes, then you have to schedule it. So if, if you implement a, a, a chat bot in between here, feed the data that we already have in the back end, or you already have, uh, this, this chat bot could be, you know, it be that replacement to, uh, to save you that time and actually book more, more, more showings here. So that's, uh, definitely something that, you know, like I said, of all the industries, I think uh, real estate and especially property managed could definitely take advantage of. So we are a very hands-on industry. I think we have a lot of procedures and practices that are very much swivel chair, where it's getting the piece of paper from over here and putting it over here. It's driving the key from the lock boxes to the actual property. So out of all the processes that are stacked up in property management, and Michael, I'm going to stay with you because you were just talking about this, but of all the processes that are like that in property management, what do you think is the lowest hanging fruit to convert into a technical process, uh, whether it's with chat GPT or just using more of the tools that already exist to kind of get rid of that piece of the puzzle? Well, I mean, I think it's the whole process, to be honest. I mean, if you really think about property management, the life cycle, I mean, 80% is repeatable uh, and the exact steps are done, right? Uh, every For every single uh, turn or or listing here. So what you know, what typically you you put a property up. It's 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 uh you, you write the market description, you list it, you price it, right? You get you get you get uh applicants, you screen, uh you choose one, you do the movement process, and then rinse and repeat, right? And that goes yeah. over. So it's it's one of those industries that is ripe for automation. Anytime you have repeatable tasks that it happens every single time. You 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 basically this is this is where automation goes. So, so I mean, just the entire workflow here uh, could greatly benefit here. So it's not one particular part, but I mean, it's it's to your point. I mean, it's a very very manual workflow driven process. And and quite honestly, I think real estate, uh, especially property management, one of those industries that has yet, in my opinion, been disrupted in terms of this. So. Like I said, it's it's very ripe for, for, for disruption in terms of AI and, and automation. Well, I'd like to open that to the others. Do you do you guys see a specific pot that's spot that's really easy to attack and convert that manual labor? Um the, well, I mean, this is just something that I heard people working on recently is like the late payment process essentially. Like if you're, you know, if you don't receive payment by X date, then that triggers a series of um, communication correspondence. Here's how the emails are structured. You know, I mean, all that. No, you don't have. You don't need a notification to a human until or to an internal resource. I mean, until after a certain point, right? So I've heard people working on that. Um, and I guess just to kind of go off of what Michael was talking about, absolutely map out the workflow. On one hand, think about okay, this is definitely a repeatable manual task that that we can just automate pretty easily. On the other hand, I think it's important to star high impact possibilities as well, right? That, and I mean, I'm sure we'll talk more about like what can be manual. But if you think about, I hear a lot of operators talk about like the the move in experience or the move in concierge, first impression, things like that. You can automate obviously the repeatable tasks, but what manual thing that's very high impact can you add on to it as well? So I see, I think both sides of the workflow are important. You got to map it out first and then kind of look at it uh, from both directions. Yeah, Wait, I can armchair. You see? Yeah. Yeah, I'll armchair quarterback this. Uh, you know, I you know, look from the outside in, the obviously we talked about this communications already. Whether you use AI or just really smart workflows, that that's the obvious. Um, uh, you know, something that I have learned as a, as a DIY is troubleshooting so you know when especially if you have any sort of funkiness to a property but also just common problems right the outlets upstairs don't work okay well they, they probably work uh it's in the fuse box just just go flip the switch right how how do you like common questions or issues and troubleshooting i think we can do a better job right off the bat right there um this actually is a basic thing it comes down to documentation um, now, how that documentation is maintained and how that in information is distributed, I think that remains some of the challenge, right? Because those questions may come in at different ways or framed differently or that sort of thing. Someone may say the power has gone out, but they just really mean one outlet. 
uh, or the fridge stopped working, that's not necessarily true. You might have just bumped something or, you know, the GFI switch, you know, that's dedicated outlet blue or something like along those lines. I, I think that those are some of the ways in which um, we can do a better job. Uh, and I've experienced both as a renter, but also as, a, as an owner, we're seeing that those are some obvious um, areas to, to remove some of that, you know, the, 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 ma- the manual labor. The other one for me is self-showing. Uh, I've talked to enough property managers to know uh, that uh, manually doing showings and enabling for self-showing, as well as uh, how that can also replace the need for rekeying locks versus having electronically controlled locks, uh, the amount of time and effort that that could save. Obviously, it's going to depend on how many doors you're managing here, but if you're growing anything uh, sizable within your region... The ability to to do uh, self guided uh, showings and to not have to go out and rekey, but you can electronically update locks as you need to. I, I think those are uh, those are probably some pretty significant wins uh, for companies. It also offers a lot more flexibility to residents, as in their the showing is based on their schedule versus the property manager or showing agent. So let's pivot right off that because I think it's really important. The access piece has been something that the larger groups, the AMH, Invitation Homes, Progress, have been trying to figure out for a while. And one of the things that kind of holds them back is having internet connectivity in the house. And so mm-hmm. as you think about internet of things, the 5G that's we now have most places, and then all the different things from water sensors to electricity sensors to locks and uh, thermostats, how does that all play into the future of the rental economy. Shoot. I got to lead off on this one. Yeah. (laughs) I, I, I I, look, I think it's, I think that's a challenge. Uh, just straight up. I I think, look, if, if invitation homes hasn't figured it out and others haven't figured it out, I'm not going to sit and pretend that I have the answer to that one. I think that one certainly is a difficulty. Um, you know, not all locks require internet connectivity that to my knowledge, like full time, uh, so it's not, they have to always be connected to a, a modem or, or signal. Uh, so, but the, then again, there's different features for different purposes. I think obviously in a multifamily building, managing digital locks, I think becomes a little bit simpler than scattered site management. Um, but again, that's from, you know, a little bit on the outsider perspective, uh, at the end of the day, if it's if it is going to cut down on your manual labor costs and or if it's going to improve the consumer experience, uh, I think it's it's a win. But you know, rightfully so, that this isn't a, an easy thing. And you're talking about access to units; it's not something to kind of flippantly make a decision and to allow anything to happen. You know, it's one thing to change you know how you're sending your emails. You know, the the re- repercussions there is going you might have a few people mad at you. Changing access to properties is kind of a, a high stakes game. Even if it's yeah. relatively simple, it's a high stakes game. So I, I think that there should be ample amount of caution taken when considering new methods or ways of allowing for access. Tim and Michael, you guys want to weigh in on yeah, access, yeah. internet of things, thermostats, any of those bits? Yeah, this, all... this is, when I own my own property management company, that was, that was a, a, a the, the biggest friction point. I mean, ideally, I would love to have automated locks and that you could remotely open and close. But the, the, the biggest friction point to the owners are, are basic cost, right? So how do, how do we, <clears throat> how do we convince the owner that this cost to them will ultimately benefit in, in, in the long run here? And, and really, if you, if you, if you looked at single family owners, my, a lot of my owners are very cost uh, conscious here, you know, they're literally, you know, I mean, 60, 70% are literally living. I mean, instead of paycheck to paycheck, rent rent payout to rent payout so they're very self-conscious about that but but absolutely i mean these these sensors ultimately you know uh could get ahead a lot of stuff here for example water leak detectors right obviously you want to get ahead of that be a lot more protective proactive a water sensor uh, water leak detector will detect the water more than likely than before a tenant will Uh, and obviously for these type of maintenance issues that you want you need to be proactive it'll save you in the end run but this these are as a previous owner and and trying to modernize quote unquote uh, a lot of my my portfolio uh cost was the the the, the biggest factor here and uh th- that was a challenge so i don't know this is where i think other companies i don't know maybe have this is why they haven't achieved it but uh but i'm curious about that as well why hasn't this adoption had 
being a current quicker. Yeah, the, yeah, I, I, I was like, I, Tim. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say quickly, I, I think Mike, you're kind of raising like a, a really important piece here, right? Like it, it, we still have to operate profitable businesses. Obviously the investors want NOI. They, you can't just turn everything into, you know, some futuristic home. And you also have to understand your demographic, like who's the resident that's actually living there. Um, and they, maybe they're not signing a lease because there's a smart thermostat. Maybe they're just signing a lease because it's a, it's a perfect neighborhood or, you know, whatever the case might be. I just, that has to be taken into account as well. So maybe, yeah, maybe you're not doing a full internet of things inside of the home, but on the process side, or when they do reach out or when they do detect an issue with their house, you're handling that with, you know, the most sophisticated technology you possibly can. So yeah, maybe it doesn't make sense dollars and cents to install all this inside of your home, but you can complement it with more sophisticated processes uh, when the resident sees an issue. Yeah. That, so Tim, on the internet, the, so I think that's... Tim, you took the words right out of my mouth <laughs> because I, I, and you, I, we must've been sharing notes before this because I, I had mm, notes similarly sure on measuring the ROI of different devices in, in the property. Um, I think though, some of this could change Michael to your point of like water sensors, you know, I had my air conditioner blower. It, it, it went out right before summer hit earlier this year, based on the efficiency it was operating at a sensor would have picked up the, Hey, this thing isn't working. Could have told my phone. I don't have that set up in my house. So I missed that, but how beneficial would that be across your scattered site of 250 units? Right. I have a, a Ting device in my house that my insurance company sent me that measures power, uh, the, both the what's being drawn, but also power outages. To, as a utility perspective, not a whole lot of help to me. To my insurance company, I'm sure they're doing something valuable with that. I think there's going to be more appetite from other companies to have something at stake, lenders and insurance providers, to want to aggregate data from the different sites. I think this will bring more of those technologies into the home. So it may not be from a perspective of, is it raising the ROI on how much we can ask for rent from the renter, but it will provide value to other companies that have in stake of that property performing well. So there is a utility, speaking of utilities, I think this is fascinating. One of the pressures that happens with a lot of these new technologies going into home is the person that's got to pay for it is a person that owns the home and then the resident gets the benefit. And so it's a hard sell sometimes for a property owner to go, hey, let's spend 250 bucks on a smart lock. Let's spend 150 bucks on a smart thermostat downstairs, 150 upstairs. That's not necessarily going to be an easy sell to the property owner. But what we are seeing is that in some places, the utilities are seeing benefit to some of this stuff. Places that are hit by storms and the storms do a lot of damage. I just read this morning, I'm trying like heck to remember where it is, but there's a utility who got approval to get more batteries in homes to decrease reliance on the grid during storms that knock down power lines. So they're burying all their power lines. They're making more and more of them impervious to tree falls. And at the same time, they're doing these mini grids where they put batteries in 40 homes in a neighborhood. And when they don't have power, they do have power, at least for an hour or two. So I think there may be stuff where this needs some of these techs may need an IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, kind of push to get them more adopted. If we can figure out a reason that collectively we think this is a good. Right? Solar panels have that issue too. Owners aren't necessarily going to put them on because they can't necessarily charge more yet. But once that's educated and people are aware they're not paying a power bill, maybe then they can. So what are what are the technologies that owners do see the return on? Like what is there anything right now that they can put in the home and it's going to push it further into the future? Hey, I'll put it on Tim. Tim, do you see anything there? Uh, I mean, the, the main one that I hear about is, is smart locks and the, the um, you know, part of it is just key management, losing keys, having to rekey, you know, the, the sort of fraud element. Um, but I, that's, that's the one that uh, a lot of our clients talk about as kind of the easiest um, thing to install. Obviously there's a cost there for sure, but um, like Nate said, I mean, access is 
everything, especially when it comes to, you know, vendor management and just in the data that you were showing before with people owning properties far away, like really far away across an ocean, right? Like you just being able to provide people access or know who's entering the home at any given time. Um, I think property management, you know, becomes more and more, you know, remote or virtually located, right? You're, you're relying on different vendors all the time. So I think smart lock just kind of has a, a lot of not just external use cases to the resident, but also internal ROI as well. Yeah. And I think that's just in talking through the owner on the equation of here's how much a rekey costs and we have to do this every turn. Here's how much a uh, drive out to let the vendor in costs. Like those stacks are transparent. We know what that costs, right? Uh, Michael, what do you see in this space? Yeah, th those are just immediate costs that they see right away, right? The, the, the hardest part is, you know, selling the in case something happens in the future, right? You know, you, yeah. the owner, if if you install this water sensor, you know, in, down the road, you this will save you X amount of money. That that was the hardest sell here. I could immediately tell, you know, hey, owner, in the past two years, you spent four four or five hundred dollars on on rekeying, right? So, uh, you know, if you put the smart lock, you know, we'll save you that. So, th so those are the immediate ones. I myself uh, own my own rental property, right? And and I see the benefit, but I haven't installed it. Uh, I, yeah. You know, to be, I don't really know why. I, I I understand the benefits, but but at the same time, you know. Uh, I just can't explain why I myself don't don't want to install it as well. Um, so so it's yeah. it's this hurdle here where you know I guess I, you know I don't see the immediate a lot of a lot of human by human nature we're all about the immediate uh, effects stuff. So but uh, but yeah this is this is interesting that um, maybe to your point if there's some government incentive or something to push me here this is where where maybe I'll quote unquote modernize my my rental property myself. Yeah, and th this is one of the things that this whole kind of conference put on by the national Rental home council kind of looks at it and can surface to them and go, Hey, we need to fix a way in the inflation reduction act so that those benefits can go to property owners and residents, like find a way to make a mutually beneficial agreement, get more wins, kind of push the tech and the support in that way. Legislatively, we did get a question. This falls on what we were talking about earlier. So I'm going to throw it to the group. The question from an anonymous attendee is, is it feasible to automate renter landlord dispute management resolution based on the lease and applicable local laws? Michael, being a property manager, you can jump into this not, first. Not now. I, I, you automate that this, this is, real estate is, is what I heard is the second most litigious industry in the US here. The first being the medical industry, right? So I, you know, I would not, one of those, one of the things that, I would not let uh, uh, AI come in or automation is dis disputes here, right? So I mean, you have to be very careful. It's I think we're way off, way far off from from that, where human emotions and and even a slight word could get you in deep trouble in real estate here, right? Especially in property management here. So um, can we? I, I, maybe many years in the future when we would train it extremely well. But again, back to the trust factor, I don't trust it just yet here, especially with uh, with the dispute resolution when human emotions and, and feelings are involved here. Tim, Nathan, the, the, uh So I, I don't have, you know, hands-on experience. So I'm coming in from the, from the left field, but the, uh, how I kind of see that scenario is maybe uh, an AI tool could be used to um, to read up on like laws and regulations and things like that, right? To kind of give you like a summary or here's the, the the just terrible legal documentation that maybe you have to read, right? Or if there's rental bylaws for an HOA or something like that. I've, I've heard operators talk about those use cases. They talk about the, the mind numbing tasks, right? And using AI as a, as a friend there. And then also what are some options, right? Just give me five ideas here of like how to handle and here's like the specific scenario and spelling that out um, to to your AI tool. Um, that's, you know, if you feel like stuck, that's sometimes I, I don't have to deal with these kinds of things. But if I'm, I'm feeling stuck, I'll oftentimes just kind of like start there to get the wheels turning or if you feel like you're at an impasse um, with your frustrated resident. I agree, but don't rely on it. You, you guys have read it in news about no. that lawyer who used ChatGPT to write his uh, legal briefs, and ChatGPT oh, no. came with fake <laughs> cases <laughs> and got in trouble with it. So, 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 yeah, don't copy don't, and paste. Yes, 
use it, but don't <laughs> rely on it, right? So that's that's uh, at this stage yeah. of, of where we're at right now, especially yeah. especially with this dispute resolution. Um, it, this is where I'm, I'm very ardent about. I don't trust it just yet. So interesting. Yeah, I think that there's a consistent piece in property management where you do have this stack of regulations that's beyond a normal organization, both because you you have housing regulations at the federal and at the state level. You sometimes have county or uh, city level regulations, but then you also have the whole National Association of Realtors, National Association of Real Property Managers that have additional stuff for being able to engage in this if you're not the owner. Like an, an owner can do a bunch of stuff, but once you're not the owner and you're working on their behalf, there's a whole bunch of agent licensed, licensed agent activity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So to pivot back over to more tech stuff so that we can, we can stay on the, the cool, sexy side of property management. Um, when we're looking at some of the longer lasting AIs, right? So we've got like the Zillow estimate, the rent estimate, the home estimate, those are all algorithmically generated. And I think right now we're kind of, fuzzing the edges between where there's an algorithm, where there's an AI, and which is which. How do we look forward and kind of go, okay, we're at the point now where this is an absolute piece, where we can trust the Zestimate because there's so much data. What has to happen in the industry with its data to allow a better truth to emerge? Does that make sense? It's an awkward question, but I, I'm curious. Well, I just from 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 my past experience, just doing basically comp analysis for rental analysis when an owner calls in here, we, you know, we, me as a human being, have just basically limited resources or data availability, right? We, we'd go to previous data within a certain area based on, you know, basically uh, the 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 bedroom size or the number of bedrooms, bath and and house size, do a similar properties and based the comp report on that, to to. Uh, a previous discussion about what actually is inside of these other comps. That's that's kind of left unknown here. What another data point that I didn't have was is what it actually rented for. So just because you advertise it doesn't necessarily mean you yeah. actually rented for it. This is a little bit different than sales, home sales, where that data is available, right? Where the 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 actual price is sold uh, that's available through the MLS various MLS data. But but there's certainly data points that I think. Uh, as an industry, this is we're not as um, uh, sophisticated, or I don't I don't know what the right word is, but we don't have as much data as 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 the sales side of real estate, right? Per se here, so right. so, but certainly uh, you know you know, and the breadth of data here, I think this is where AI can definitely help. Is not only just look at that data, but other factors that affect rental uh, price increases. Um, like I said, um, um, having additional data, but uh you know crime rate area but there's uh, ai can get so much more channels uh for for data here that that can help with but but me as a as a as a lonely uh property manager had very limited resources and not and and more importantly missing data right yeah fair yeah, yeah i think that's a big yeah go ahead Nick. go ahead yeah i i think actually if i'm if we're allowed to talk here in a futuristic and not have to put details on things, right? Go for it. Well, I think one of the biggest underutilized data sets that exists is Google Street View. Uh, so we have our streets mapped, photographed. You can see what's happening you know, during the day in a neighborhood. When my wife and I moved to downtown Chicago and we were looking at different neighborhoods, one thing we were looking for was are people out running? Are there joggers on the sidewalks? And it might be such a minor detail for some, but for us and for me, that was an indication of feeling of safety, feeling of a place that people were enjoying their neighborhood. Were they out walking around? Uh, there are some areas you're going to see a lot more of that than others. And so this is one of those, like I think, a very difficult thing. And this is more on the uh, tech side. How are we going to implement this so that property managers can create better revenue management tools uh, for their properties aside from it's a two, three, you know, with a extra large yeah. closet. And it's a, today it's a little bit of an intangible. It's a hard to describe thing. It's an unstructured data set 
And this is where AI actually starts to shine. This is not an algorithmic, just pure algorithm, if left, go right kind of thing. So it, I think it's going to take a lot of work. I'm certainly not the scientist to be able to figure this out. Um, but I think leveraging more visual data, you know, Tim, you guys doing inside photographs, I think street view in complementary with that uh, could in of itself become a, a really valuable data set. It's already accessible. I do think Though once you get into the API, it gets expensive. But you know, if that can get figured out, I think that could offer a little bit more of a pinpoint revenue management style uh, tool for property managers to use. And it, it's interesting, Nate, because when you're when you're saying that, I'm I'm kind of thinking that you know maybe one of the opportunities is exploring deeper and deeper into just you know why do people make the decision that they make about where they want to live, right? And I mean, we're all familiar with like the classic things, right? Like low crime, great schools, but what, like, you know, the, the intangibles, can you, can you write that down somehow? Can you, like you just said, there's joggers around and we love that, right? I, I, that could, that's kind of an interesting opportunity, but I think overall, especially in housing, it's, I mean, I keep going back to Michael, I wrote this down and put a big star on it, just the word trust, right? Like there. It's, it's, we're not just buying like ham sandwiches, right? We're, we're choosing where we're going to live, where our family's going to live. I mean, it's a massive investment. So I, I think no matter what, even with an infinite data set, you're still going to be like, I, I, it just feels like, okay, I'm going to move to Nashville, go buy a house for me. I, I still will want to make the decision in the end, I think, for, as a human. Um, it, it'll, you know, it's like if you um, go to Southwest and you book a flight, right? They give you the menu of the flight options. They don't just say, here you go. Cause I want to kind of choose my value in some way, even if that, you know, it's, it's like a psychological thing, I, I think. So I think no matter how much data there, there is, no matter how great the AI software is, we're still going to want to see, okay, here are my options. And maybe it'll do a great job presenting those options and say, here's why we recommended these. And here's why I recommended those. But I think humans will still want to say, I've made the decision in the end. That's my, that's my take. I think that's interesting because it sounds like you're talking a more robust Zillow suggestion engine. Because right now, if you log in and make a search, you get all these, hey, a new property that matches your search. Hey, this is similar in a different neighborhood. Did you think about this? But with what Nate's saying about neighborhood data, there was a, a website, I think it's still around, called Walk Score, that kind of mm -hmm. told you how walkable the neighborhood was. And then that combined with Google Street View of how many run down cars or in front yards in this neighborhood like that that all of a sudden this intangible data starts concretizing and do you get to a point where out of the blue the algorithm knows that or the ai knows that your lease is up in 30 days and goes you want more closet space that's what you wanted last time there's a place right down the street that's got a huge closet so we just got a couple minutes left so for our last couple of minutes i want i want to just big future scope, big future scope, right? So in 2044, what will renting a single family home look like? We're going to start with Tim. Uh-oh. I think it's funny because I kind of, well, first of all, it'd be great to have like the Jetsons robot thing, right? Like a Roomba AI assistant that can sweep and fold laundry and things like that. So I don't know how close we'll be to that in 2044, you just kinda... but- That'd tape cool. a Google Home on top of a Roomba and you're basically there. And then, <laughs> just some duct tape and a, yeah. I'm a genius. Yep. Um, I I was thinking about kind of the, the maintenance side. I, I guess it's something that I want to watch is uh, how smart can homes become. But, you know, there's the big obstacles that we've already talked about because um, it'd be great for the house to kind of prompt you and say, hey, this needs to happen. Um, so I'll, I want to watch that. I don't, I can't make like a big, bold prediction for me. And I don't know if this is 20 years or maybe five years or something, but the, the big thing I want to watch is the, you know, the ability to kind of use these technologies to handle the, the minutia. It allows PMs to focus more on their brand and the resident experience and the customer experience. I think that'll be really interesting. Like the concept of, creating wow moments and, you know, creating evangelists out of these residents and allowing them to move from, if they need to move to a different market, they'll think of their property management brand first. 
Um, I just think that evolution will be really interesting because, you know, years ago when I started in this industry, it was all, oh, PM, such a tough business, two stars on Google, and that's it. But we're all trying to figure out how to flip that on its head. And um, I don't, it's not like the sexy technology thing, but that's that's what I'm watching. I, I think that evolution will be really interesting. All right, we're going to go with Michael next. <laughs> 40 years from now, right? Is that what the... No, in 2044, 20, so 20... 20 I, I could now. barely know what's going to happen here by in a year. But <laughs> uh, but I mean, if you really want honest opinion, where are we going to be in the next 20 years? You, you've seen the movie Idiocracy, right? So, so yeah. I literally think we're going to be in, sitting in pods with these Google <laughs> glasses or whatever you call it. And just that's how we're going to be living. I mean, I, I, I joke about it, but it, it seems to be headed that way here. And by the way, Tim, I think it kind of, I wanted to hit it on that, but, but I guess we're running out of time, but you know, where Facebook and, and Apple are coming with their, with their vision goggles, I don't know, what do you call those? What do you call I I goggle now? What do they call them? But, but how that interface, I think within that, I think that will, I don't know, uh, hopefully that plays a little bit more in, in more of an immersive type of 3D tour here. Uh, I what what I envision eventually, or what, what I'm hoping that we get to is uh, for our company is that basically maybe just a a, a one click. Uh, this is this is kind of a, a a takeaway from Intuit when I worked in a TurboTax group. Our, our initiative was you'll do your taxes in one click, right? And so this is kind of where the convenience factor here is. So you do your background screening, you already have your 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 background check with you, and you can apply that. We go to any property and within one click you uh um uh accepted it and 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 moved in right technically right so so kind of the convenience factor where you view a property you already you already have the key to get in uh e key uh background check and you can literally walk in hit the okay button and you're you moved in right so that's kind of the vision where i see within the next i can't so say so much 20 years from now but within the next five ten years here Hey, thanks, Michael. Nate, I'm going to let you have the last word on this one. 2044. All right, I'm going to take the contrarian. Like? I'm going to take the contrarian view to Michael. 22 years ago, Donald Davahoff built the first and released the first revenue management for multifamily housing. We're still not there. I, I think that I think real estate is still going to move slow. I think uh, as much as we want it to to be awesome and super futuristic, I, and genuinely, I think it's going to still be a people business. PMCs are going to be still very much demand. I do think the stakes will be higher uh, for those who are not leveraging smart systems and that sort of and automations and streamlined communications. You're not going to be able to last. But I also think you're going to have to face stiffer legal legislations and requirements for record keeping maintaining privacy and security of residents and following uh, tighter, uh, stringent rules on housing. I, I don't see a slowdown there. I see that only increasing, which will really require people to move and totally move totally away from uh, paper, pencil, any sort of like uh, antiquated methods, uh, obviously cash and checks, I think maybe will finally be gone. <laughs> I can only hope so that they'll be finally gone. 20 years from now in the industry. Um, but I, 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 those are some of the, my thoughts on where the industry would be at. I think it'll look very similar, just hopefully just be better.